good. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today and to talk to you. The World Economic Forum said that in the next years, we will have about 133 million new jobs, which needs to be created to meet the demand of the digital age. These were numbers, of course, post uh, pre-corona, um, but I do not think that post-corona, there will be a shortage of jobs needed in the digital economy. The core skills, you can go to the next slide, Pete, please. And the core skills in existing jobs needs to change. By 2030, the World Economic Forum predicts that we need about 1 billion reskilled people. The open vacancies in the German IT sector rose from 43,000 people in 2012 to around 124,000 in 2019. Deutsche Telekom, of course, um, have similar challenges than many, many other industries. We need to transform from, to a high performance expert organization, which means that we need different skills than we have today. We obviously have a much stronger focus on NT and IT skills. These are the profiles of software engineers, data analysts, DevOps engineers, um, cloudification skills, et cetera. These kind of skills are scarce. The demand is growing everywhere. Um, you know, all the GAFAs are looking for these skills. Small entrepreneurial companies are looking for these skills. We also have an interesting demographic challenge within Deutsche Telekom, I think as in many other German or European companies, where you have an older average age of, age of employees, but also people who have at least another 10 to 12 years of work ahead of them. We will not find all of these skills that we are looking for in Germany. Where do we find them and how do we do this? So please go to the next slide. We obviously need a holistic framework with which to tackle this challenge. This is something that we call our skills transformation house. Um, and it's an absolutely holistic and integrated picture because I believe that it will be very difficult to talk about the topic of skills transformation or new skills acquisition without looking at it holistically. Please allow me to briefly explain all of the pillars and then I will focus on the new skilling pillar on the left, which is really the, the, the topic of our conversation today. All of our thinking regarding new skilling or skills transformation is based on the foundation of something we call the ecosystem of lifelong learning. We believe that creating an ecosystem of long life, uh, lifelong learning is this foundation for a successful intervention when it comes to skills. This has to do with fostering a mindset of being curious, of learning, and of feeling safe enough to try new things. We also mean with this providing excellent learning platforms. We also encourage learning in communities. For example, our Network Differentiated Academy takes the form of a community when it looks at their learning. We look at various peer-to-peer -peer initiatives. Winfred Eber, um, who's also here today, will be one of the other DT uh, colleagues that will talk about these communities. We obviously also encourage activities such as Learn OS, where several of our colleagues join and share in the learning. Tilo Mosh I've seen here. I think Annalena is also in here. Um, and they are part of these, these um, new skilling initiatives. The next frame that we have is demand and analytics. We base our setting up of skills academies and new learning opportunities based on analytics to determine which skills are needed, how many of these skills are needed, but also the very challenging question of which skills do we need less of so that we know to target and focus those people who are maybe in areas where we need less of those skills,
to transition then, then into the areas where we need more of. We have a pillar there which is called source and retain. Obviously, to find these new skills that we need, you will not find all of them in the market. We think that we will be able to retrain 25 to 30% of current employees into these new areas, but other people we will have to find through sourcing, through retaining, of course. You know, this is then where we have to look at topics like providing expert careers, where we look at topics like talent management, because if we invest in developing people, how do we ensure we retain this talent for us? And on the right, we have a pillar which we call human-centered organization. And this is where we look at how ready is the organization to retain people? How do we create a high-performance environment? How do we give feedback? How do we enable individual change? I will talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the challenges when it comes to skills transformation, because this is at a personal level, not an easy topic for a lot of people. It's a huge change journey that people have to embark upon. And then we talk in that area also around skills by skill-based organizations, et cetera. But let me come to new skilling. New skilling, we believe there are about four ways in which we new skill people. We start at the explorer level. Explore means all employees to become conversant in a number of topics that we choose. For example, we believe that everybody who works in Deutsche Telekom needs to know something about cloud, needs to know something about the internet of things, needs to know something about software development or data analytics and how that could be used. So these are two to three hour, hours worth of modules or training or learnings just to become conversant. So this is the first level, this is the explorer level. The next level is something we call a career shifter. And the career shifter level is really where we focus on this new skilling initiatives. This is literally where you provide new skills for people to shift from one career to a new career. And this is the one where I will give you some examples of what we are doing today. Then at the third level, we're talking about from good to great. And this is an area of upskilling where we say that really everybody within the organization needs to do something to get better in the field that they are. It might be that you are not a software engineer, um, but you are maybe in the human resources environment, but you need a new skill set to function according to new, um, new expectations of the business with the new technologies that we are talking about in a more digitized format. So there's an upskilling needed within your current role. This is the third level. And then there's a handful of people that we believe, especially in specific technical areas, that will become thought leaders. Um, super, super experts, a very small group of people that we will really um, create a super expert community for. Um, when we look at the next slide, please, you look at, on the next slide, you will see our new skilling offers. Now, the new skilling offers are um, different ranges of offers that we have. In the yellow there, you see all of the facilitation roles. And the facilitation roles is, for example, something like a scrum, a scrum master or a safe program consultant. And these are the facilitation roles, and these are the different academies that we offer to train people in these facilitation roles. In the green, you see all of our engineering roles at the moment. And this, um, I just have to say that this slide literally changes on a weekly basis, because this is where we constantly look at the needs of the business. What do we need to do next? What is new? What is necessary? And this is where we add those. So in the engineering, um, roles category, you see the software engineers, developers, DevOps engineers, AI and data analytics um, uh, chapter or, or, or um, academy. These are the engineering roles. The blue, you see the architecture roles. And in architecture, we, for example, one example of that is our network differentiation academy. Um, and this is where we focus on these roles. 
over the last 18 months or so, we've had more than 1,000 employees who have completed specific qualifications and actually have entered new roles um, or upskilled in a specific area. We develop these academies with external providers and, and leading providers in the market, and we follow a very modular approach. Um, this allows us then to add new academies as we need them. So what do these academies look like? Um, we've looked, I, I want to just as an example today, talk to you about two um, engineering roles that we've looked at. And one of our most critical offers that we've started is in these software engineering um, academies. And here we have two offers at the moment. Um, the one offer is for colleagues who has some experience, who somewhere in their history had something to do with software development or they trained or they studied something, but they haven't worked in this field. So they need to get additional information to become comfortable and confident again. Um, and then we have another academy, which is for people who have never had any previous knowledge or experience. And the target qualification for both these two academies is a junior level software engineer. And these are typical of our career shifter academies. The uh, curriculum is based on a scalable, um, market proven education concept that we've, that we've found from an external provider. And this includes up to seven months of off the job training. This seven months has about three months of a boot camp component, and then two times two months where people are actually already working on the job and where they are working in some real life projects to start to practice these skills um, that, they've, that they've been taught. Um, it's really not just you know, about saying numbers and about saying we are every year or every month, we are having these, these numbers of people go, going through this academy. It's very important for us that we understand that a lot of people, it's, it's, it's human stories that, that, we, that we see and listen, listen to. For example, on one of our, our um, software engineering academies, one of the participants is a woman that was on her way back now to become a software developer. She starting, started to work as a software developer, I think for DT in 1999, but at that stage there was a decision, um, you know, that software development was really outsourced. Um, and therefore she didn't work in this field for the last 20 years. And without the academy, she would never have dared to go back into this field. She then signed up for this one academy. Um, she did the, the theory and the practical phases and she really, when you ask her today, she says that the learning works. So she was able to catch up um, and to start to work in this area. And she had a tremendous amount of fun. Um, one of the, the key messages that you get when you talk to all of, all of the people who have gone through, this, gone through this is that everybody had to make a step to leave their comfort zone. Um, next slide, please. The next slide is a very interesting thing, and this is really, I want to stop here for a few minutes to talk about our key learnings. And it starts with saying on the slide there that skills transformation is a marathon. This is not a quick fix. This is not something that you do and show the final result at the end of 12 months. This is a journey that we embark upon. Um, and there, there really are no quick fixes. And I will talk about what this slide means for us now. What is really critical is for top management to recognize that this, is, this initiative of skills transformation is actually linked to the strategic imperatives of the organization. And, and that it's a, it's a critical component to enable us to execute on our strategy so, so that skills transformation is seen as a strategic initiative and not a nice to have. The second is we found in our learning the last few, I would say 18 months, that a thorough analysis or some kind of way to analyze and to do analytics is helpful 
to have transparency on what the skills are that is needed and on helping drive the, the process forward. The third important lesson that we've learned is business is the driver. This cannot be driven by HR or by transformation or by a separate department. Business needs to take full ownership. If you do not have the business owner, the leader of a business of an area seeing this as a critical topic, it will not become successful. It will not get the support necessary because a critical component to the development of these academies, for example, is that the content needs to be developed, needs to be approved by the business. They are the people that are working on these topics. They need, to, they know what skills are needed um, by the business. So it, it's a critical component. A fundamental pillar, of course, of this is the learning culture that I spoke about in the beginning, is that you need to create an environment for learning to happen, for people to be feel safe and to feel comfortable that that learning is, is really high priority for the business. We are also facing challenges. And one of the challenges we are facing is illustrated by this um, slide that you see, where we say, currently what happens is if you are 45 years old, for example, and you are currently in, an, in a role, which we can say we call it old skills, you are competent, you are doing it well. Um, you are an expert maybe in the field that you are currently working. If you then go to the new skills area, you go to the, to the section where you, say, where you do the new skills poorly. This is at the right bottom hand of this unhappy face that you see, which means for a short period of time, you are learning new skills and you are not an expert in those new skills. You are maybe not even doing it well in the beginning. Clearly, you are not doing it well in the beginning. You are learning. And you do that for a while. You sit in that poorly bottom hand, right hand corner with an unhappy face before over time then you move to the left, which means you are doing the new skills well, where it is now becoming comfortable, where you, where you are knowledgeable and where you are experienced in this area. Now, what we have found is that people feel very uncomfortable with this process. It's very difficult. And when we try to start the process to try to convince people to leave their old role and to enter a skills academy, it, it was a big challenge at a personal level because I come from a space where I'm an expert. I've been doing this job for 25 years or 20 years. Now I have to move into an area where I don't know. I lose that feeling of seniority in terms of competence in the field that I'm working in. And it's a big mind shift that needs to take place within the individual. It is also a mind shift that needs to take place within our organization because our leaders and our managers need to trust that when people have gone through that process, when they come out of the academy, as a junior level, although they are a senior person, that we put them onto real jobs, real projects, real opportunities to practice those skills, and that we give some time to people to become experts and to become more knowledgeable in those areas. So the trust of the employees for the organization, trusting that we will support them through this process, trusting that we will give them the opportunities to practice these new skills is critical. Um, and then the trust, to gain the trust of the managers and the leaders within the organization to use people who've come through this process. Of course, maybe just one, one uh, comment, Corona was a massive challenge for us during this time period as well. Um, and we were able to transition most of the academies. We started one of our academies, which is the, the Artificial Intelligence and Data Analytics Academy, we actually launched on time, um, virtually, fully virtually. It's of course not always ideal for all of this to happen like this, but we were able to do many of them. Some of them had to be postponed for a few weeks um, and it slowed us down a bit, but we actually made this quite well so far. So I think I end here. I think I've now spent my 15 minutes. So. Over back to you. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer.
much for all the insights and there are a lot of questions. Uh, let me select a few questions. I think we cannot go through all the questions. One question or one group of questions is around uh, the skill transformation process. Uh, is it uh, also driven up, uh, bottom up, or is it only via or is it via communities or is it top down? So, uh, how is the process organized? Yeah, so I think where it started is we created this visibility. So, we started with a process where we said, what skills do we need? So we, we gained some transparency, some visibility in the organization to say we need by in four years' time, we need thousand software developers. And we so this gave us the, the, the possibility to start and create the academy. We then had an approach of really going to the people. And so this was not a top-down approach then. This was approach of a lot of communication, a lot of discussion. Um, there were two ways, and there are two different kind of communities. You have some leaders and managers who are driving this very hard, so they would talk to their people a lot about this topic, and they would encourage them. At the same time, we had different communities. We had different platforms. We had different ways of creating excitement. We had some boot camp experiences and some opportunities where we spoke to people and where people could come, um, come together and ask questions. Um, and then they could put their hand up for this opportunity. So the first, some of the first uh, initiatives we saw, it was a slightly slower update. But in some parts of our business, we were very driven very closely with the business. We've had no problem to fill all of the seats and actually sell out very quickly. So it's a, it's a, it's a really a mix. Um, there are also communities that have that that was created and that started. Um, but it, it was also trying to encourage people and to start to create this culture where we say learning is important and each of us um, have to, to start to take this challenge of, of learning, of starting to, to learn new skills. Okay, so if I understood you right, it starts uh, on a strategic level, on a demand level, on a top-down level, but then it uh, moves very much to a situation where experts, people, community uh, join the play and uh, drive uh, the whole thing forward. Exactly. One of the communities that we created is the Network Differentiation Academy. We realized this is a community, a community where you have architects, um, especially network architects across the organization. And these are people with 20, 30 years of experience. So incredibly mm. senior experts. But as you know, with, with IT and, and with softwareization, with cloud, there's a lot of, the, of, of that new skills and new knowledge necessary to come into this area of the network architecture. And we realized that we wouldn't be able to put together a, a frame or one training module. We needed the experts to actually design the training. And this is where we then went into the, to the, to the organization and chose five expert architects, young guys and, and, and women who then took a topic lead. We decided these are the five topics they decided from a business perspective. And then they started to create communities around which this has been growing um, and we, we, they have different inputs into that and different people taking part in that. Okay, so thank you. At Deutsche Telekom, there are many, many learning professionals. Uh, how have you convinced the learning professionals to change their role? <laughs> this is a constant challenge. It's something that we're learning all the time. And I think what we are learning and, and what, we've, what was a hard lesson for a lot of people to learn is that if you think you're a learning expert and you develop a training program in isolation, you can develop the most beautiful, the most perfect program. But if the business does not see this as necessary, if the business does not feel that it answers the need, you will have no one attending this. Mm -hmm. And obviously all of these trainings had to be developed with all of the challenges of different people, different uh, ways of working that we had in the environment. So, so it's, it's not an easy process, but it's, it's a journey. And I think as much learning has to happen with the learning professionals and the learning experts as with anybody else. Mm -hmm. And what have you done to, to convince uh, the business owners? Um, I, I think what helped very much in one of our big business areas, which is the, the LIT, we had a senior leader, the managing director of that business, who is passionate about skills transformation and about 
people learning and, and he believes passionately that he cannot transform the business. He cannot achieve the business goals, the very, very hard business goals without transforming people, without people you know, getting new skills. So that, of course, from a from a very senior strategic um, a, a approach, helped to convince then obviously a lot of leaders and a lot of people. So that 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 helped. Um, but I think we are in a phase where people are so acutely feeling the change of what is happening. I think Corona as well brought in you know the reality to people of how much we have to learn how much more and how much more quickly we need to digitize um so in a in a way it is something that is starting to snowball people are, are just starting to learn and to see that this is critical okay so thank you very much Maria, for all the insights first of me my private applause here but uh, <laughs> there will be also applause from the community yeah you can see it okay <laughs> Good, it was good to have you here. And I hope in, we will have a Learner S camp uh, next year in Deutsche Telekom. It would be fine. Thank you very much. It would be fantastic. It would yeah. be good to see you here. Good and, yeah. and good learning and continue the learning okay. journey tonight and tomorrow. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye.